Hey guys, today I'll show you a horror thriller TV series named Midnight Mass. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins with a man named Riley, suffering a tragic price for driving under the influence of alcohol. He caused a traffic accident that claimed the life of a young girl in the prime of her youth. The court sentenced him in prison for years and ordered him to pay the victim's family hundreds of thousands of dollars. Years of hard work and savings vanished overnight due to his decision to drive drunk. He was consumed with guilt for ending the life of a victim girl and regretted that his promising future was ruined by his own hands. Since then, he never had a good night's sleep because every night, the image of the victim girl with her face covered in shards of glass would haunt him. Day after day, the girl he had hit never ceased to be his nightmare. Four years later, Riley was released on parole with nowhere to go but his hometown, a secluded island with a population of just 127. His mother was overjoyed to hear of her son's release, and the family of four could finally be reunited. At that moment, Riley's brother, Warren, approached, telling their mother he was going to hang out with his classmates. They had arranged to meet at the dock, where a crew member who could sell them cigarettes was waiting. Meanwhile, another person returned home, dragging a large wooden box. He knelt on the floor, knocked twice, and after two seconds, a response came from inside the box before he unlocked it. As the sun set, the three men rowed a Tesla boat without battery to a deserted island across the water. The island was filled with eerie cat cries. They arrived at their usual spot and shot the breeze. However, in the midst of their lively conversation, Warren saw a ghostly figure flash by. He was so scared that he sat down with a thud. When he looked again, the figure had vanished. He convinced himself that it was just a trick of the eye. The next morning, Riley finally returned to his hometown. Since his brother and father were out fishing, only his mother came to the dock to greet him. She fussed over Riley with tender love and care. At the same time, a middle-aged woman named Bev arrived at the dock. She was responsible for the island's church and was there to pick up Father John. But strangely, no one had seen the priest, which left Bev feeling very puzzled. Elsewhere on the island, the only doctor, Sarah, was performing an ultrasound for Aaron, who was five months pregnant. All was well, the baby was healthy. It turns out that just a few months prior, Aaron's mother had passed away, prompting her to return to the island alone, already pregnant. She took over her mother's job and became a teacher on the island. However, no one knew who the father of her child was, nor why she chose to stay on this desolate island, a place seemingly forgotten by birds in flight. During conversation, she caught a glimpse of Riley and his mother returning from the dock. Her expression suggested that the relationship between the two was anything but ordinary. In the evening, Riley's family of four, after many years, finally shared a reunion dinner. His father, eager to help his son move past the shadow of the car accident, ordered him to attend Mass at the church from now on. He believed that God would cleanse the stains from Riley's soul. The scene shifts to Bev returning to the church. She notices the light on at the priest's doorstep. It seems Father John must have returned to the island before her. Bev, finding no response to her knocking, enters the house. What she sees are scattered backpacks and luggage, and a large, mysterious box with its lock undone. Just as Bev is about to open the box to inspect it, a figure slowly approaches. From her reaction, it's clear this person is not the familiar Father John. In the southeastern United States lies an island community with only 127 residents. Isolated from the world, they live unaware of global events. In theory, the neighbors here should all live in harmony. However, the reality is quite different. An oil spill three years ago caused a big fire and shattered the peaceful atmosphere of the island. Just yesterday, a young man with a tarnished reputation, Riley, and an unfamiliar yet charismatic priest, Father Paul, arrived at the scene. Their presence further unsettled the already discordant island community. Father Paul told the congregation attending Mass that the 80-year-old Father John had fallen ill on a pilgrimage and was currently in a hospital for recuperation. Therefore, the diocese sent him to fill in for Father John for a while. On this island, most of its residents profess belief in God, believing that their faith is vitally important to their lives, and many of them would attend church services weekly. A key part of the Mass is the consumption of Holy Communion, all prepared in advance by the new priest. As everyone went to receive communion, only Riley remained seated, feeling unworthy in his unclean state. But Father Paul told him that God is not as interested in those who are absolutely pure. As Riley left the church, he saw his first love, Aaron, who had left without a word years ago. 
She's now standing across the street waiting for him. He approached calmly. Aaron remarked that the prodigal son had returned. Riley replied with a smile, saying that she was the prodigal instead and he was just a black sheep. They agreed to walk and talk, and as they did, the middle-aged spinster Bev looked on with what seemed to be hostility. After years apart, during which both had sworn never to spend the rest of their lives on the island, they had met again at the starting point. It turned out they had both ventured into the world, only to return to their hometown with scars. Times had changed. Aaron was now visibly pregnant, and Riley had weathered the years. They were both deeply moved by each other's experiences. After everyone had left, Bev returned to the church and questioned Father Paul why he was wearing a golden vestment since today wasn't a special day. So Father Paul explained that he couldn't find the green vestment at Father John's home and in a hurry chose gold instead. However, perhaps for Father Paul, today was indeed a special day. As evening approached, the wind howled and dark clouds gathered, followed by a heavy downpour. Father Paul sat on the sofa reading the Bible calmly when suddenly lightning flashed. At that moment, Dr. Sarah's elderly mother became unusually agitated. Riley stood by the window watching the scene outside when in the next second he saw a figure in the flash of lightning. He quickly called his family over, claiming he saw Father John walking alone on the beach, but his family saw nothing, not even a ghostly shadow. His mother thought he must be mistaken because Father John was still recuperating in a mainland hospital. It was impossible for him to be here. But Riley insisted, explaining that he was certain it was Father John because he recognized his long coat and hat. Since his family didn't believe him, he had to verify it himself. After rushing out the door, he indeed saw the man in the trench coat. The man looked back when he heard Riley's call and then started running. Because the visibility was poor and the rain was heavy, Riley couldn't see the man's face clearly, thus couldn't confirm who he was. In the ensuing chase, the trench coat man mysteriously vanished. After the storm, a very strange scene occurred. The island's beach was littered with the bodies of wild cats, with hundreds of seagulls circling overhead. The sheriff discovered that all the cats' necks had been bitten through, and their bodies showed signs of tearing. Strangely, there was no blood found on either the cat bodies or the beach, which puzzled the sheriff greatly. The mayor, however, didn't seem to care much, and suggested it might have been the work of small sharks or ospreys. Thus, the mayor decided to burn the cat corpses. Riley told the mayor and some others about seeing Father John the previous night, and as expected, no one believed his bullshit. Even Riley began to doubt himself since Father John was still in a mainland hospital and couldn't possibly be back. So who was the man in the trench coat last night? For some reason, only three people attended the church mass today. Besides Riley's mother and an old lady also present, there was Lisa, who's paralyzed in both legs. All three drank the holy wine and ate the holy bread. After the mass, the kind and friendly Father Paul chatted and laughed with the girl Lisa all the way, and it was evident that she liked the new priest. However, when Lisa saw a bearded old man, her expression instantly became blank. The old man, whose name is Joe, also left hurriedly with his dog, looking embarrassed. It was clear that there must be some past issues between the two. After parting ways, Father Paul paid a visit to Dr. Sarah's home. He had learned that Sarah's elderly mother suffered from Alzheimer's disease and was unable to attend Mass. So Father Paul took the initiative to offer a private service for the 80-year-old lady. Unexpectedly upon seeing Father Paul, the old woman mistook him for Father John. It was clear that her illness was quite advanced. After Dr. Sarah stepped out, Father Paul was moved to tears by the elderly woman's condition, and he proceeded to conduct the Mass, personally feeding her the holy bread and giving her the holy wine. That evening, while Riley's mother was mending clothes, she accidentally pricked her finger. From that moment, she realized that her presbyopia, which had been troubling her for some time, had miraculously disappeared. She was astonished, wondering if such an eye condition could heal on its own. At this time, Riley, who had been to the mainland for an alcoholics meeting, returned home, seeming in low spirits. As he lay in bed, the image of the victim girl he had accidentally killed haunted him again. That same night, an unidentified flying object appeared to be searching for a place to land, eventually settling on an abandoned house on the island, unbeknownst to its residents. On Easter Day, the church organized a communal meal. The entire island community came together to eat, drink, and be merry. Father Paul told Riley that he planned to hold a weekly sobriety meeting at the church, so Riley wouldn't have to make the difficult trip to the mainland every week. Riley was naturally happy to participate. Suddenly, an unknown person gave a hamburger to Joe's dog. Shortly after eating it, the dog collapsed in pain, whimpering and bleeding from its mouth. It was clear the dog had been poisoned. 
Joe, choking back tears, asked the crowd who would commit such a cruel act against a helpless dog. Everyone else simply looked on with indifference, indicating that Joe was not well-liked among the community, possibly due to his messy and smelly beard. Meanwhile, Aaron's attention was drawn to Bev nearby. Just the day before, she had seen Bev sneakily handling rats in the school's storeroom. Joe actually knew who was responsible for poisoning his dog. He glared at Bev with resentment, but refrained from taking further action, knowing he had no evidence against her. Even if he could prove it, he knew he wouldn't be able to confront her. He was aware that he was no match for the spinster, and had no choice but to swallow his anger in silence. On Easter evening, Erin was sorting through photos when she suddenly heard sounds from the roof. She looked out the window and saw a figure dressed like an old priest appear in the night. Meanwhile, at the doctor's house, Sarah's elderly mother began shouting, claiming she saw her husband's figure, though he had died 15 years ago. But the mother still insisted it was her late husband. However, the weirdness didn't end there. A sailor on his way home saw a door of a nearby house open by itself. He stopped and walked towards the house, asking if anyone was there. As he was about to leave with no response, a voice echoed what he just said. Driven by curiosity, he entered the house only to find a monster lurking in the dark, and suddenly, he was attacked to the ground. That's where the real drama began. Father Paul's arrival on the island ignited a fervent religious passion among the islanders. That day, the island residents came to attend Mass, where Father Paul challenged Lisa, a girl paralyzed for years, to stand from her wheelchair and take communion. Everyone thought the priest was joking, and Lisa's father questioned him. Teacher Aaron thought it was an insult to the disabled and quickly intervened. But when it seemed impossible, a miracle happened. Lisa stood up from her wheelchair. Everyone in the church was astonished. It was unbelievable. However, the miracle wasn't just with Lisa. Everyone who attended Mass regularly experienced tremendous changes. Riley's mother's presbyopia was cured, and the back pain that plagued Riley's father disappeared. In high spirits, they danced to the music in TikTok style, and hand in hand, they headed to their bedroom for a hormone yoga session. In the next scene, Warren and Lisa floated on the sea in a manual Tesla boat, sharing their first kiss. Riley took the opportunity of the night to visit his first love, Aaron. Over coffee, they reminisced about the past and slowly rediscovered their initial feelings for each other. However, the most significant change was seen in Dr. Sarah's mother. This 80-year-old woman, bedridden and suffering from Alzheimer's, not only began to walk, but also regained all her memories. Uninvited, Lisa came to Joe's house that day, finally confronting her past. It turned out Joe was the one responsible for the accident that caused Lisa's paralysis years ago. A drunken mistake had led to the tragedy. Lisa expressed all her pent-up sorrow and anger, but in the end, the kind-hearted girl chose to forgive. Now everyone attending Mass on the island has witnessed real changes. Even those who previously did not believe in religion have found themselves unable to deny it. From that point on, every seat was filled whenever Mass was held in the church. But on this particular day, Father Paul, while preaching doctrine, suddenly collapsed, his legs giving out beneath him. After examining him, Dr. Sarah believed there wasn't much to worry about. However, when he returned to the church that evening, he collapsed once again. This time, he convulsed all over, and a pink liquid kept pouring out of his mouth. It was eerily similar to the symptoms of Joe's dog when it was poisoned, which indicates that Bev might have poisoned Father Paul. The scenes flashes back to an old man with Alzheimer's disease who became separated from his tour group and found himself in a vast desert. Struggling through a sandstorm, the sand lashed against his face and got into his eyes. Just as he was about to give up, he suddenly saw a dark opening atop a sand dune. In his confused state of mind, he eagerly entered it. Inside the pitch-dark cave, he struck a match and was startled to see a pair of bright eyes not far away. Lighting another match, a winged creature appeared before him. The creature bit into his neck and quickly drained his blood, but the old man did not die. Instead, the creature slit its own arm and let the old man drink its blood. The next day, when the old man woke up, he had returned to his youthful appearance. It turns out he was in fact the very same John, who is now Father Paul. Believing it to be a miracle, he knelt down and worshipped the angel that had given him a new lease on life. As the only priest on the secluded island, he thought to bring this miracle back with him. So, he transported the angel back in a large crate, which explained why so many wild cats on the island had mysteriously died. It was all the work of the angel. Back to the present, Father Paul, who lay dying on the ground, woke up again, startling everyone. 
Bev, who initially was shocked, began to feel a secret relief, thankful that she had withdrawn the poison in time. As for why she had poisoned Father Paul and then retracted the poison, the answer lay in an old photo of Father John on the wall. After surviving this ordeal, Bev became the priest's right-hand woman. The next morning, as Bev brought food to Father Paul, she went to open the curtains, but he quickly stopped her, claiming his eyes were uncomfortable. But before leaving the room, Bev told the priest that he should tell people who he is. If he thinks they are not ready to accept him yet, that's fine. After all, Jesus didn't rush to appear after his resurrection. She added that if they knew that Father John was resurrected by God's angel, what a marvelous revelation that would be. It seemed Bev had known that Father Paul was indeed Father John. As evening fell, Riley arrived at the church for the arranged sobriety meeting. Upon entering, he spotted Joe, the notorious drunk with the big beard, sitting opposite the priest. It turned out that Joe had finally resolved a years-long burden, forgiven by Lisa he had once harmed, leaving her paralyzed. Determined to turn over a new leaf, he decided to attend the sobriety meeting. Riley was delighted to hear this, and on the way home, the two chatted amiably. Joe wasn't as bad as people thought. He had a clear perspective on life and stood by his principles. Ever since Lisa's incident, he lived in constant self-reproach and regret. Now, forgiven by Lisa, he found the strength to really live again. The two agreed not to be late for the next sobriety meeting, but Riley could never have imagined that this would be their last encounter. The next day, battling his alcohol craving, Joe went to the supermarket. He stared at the beer in the cooler, torn. Ultimately, he resisted, committing to his decision to start anew. He decided to seek out the priest for a chat to help him kick the habit. However, Father Paul seemed rather off at the moment, kneeling on the floor, fervently praying for the angel to show itself soon. As he struggled with his craving, Joe appeared at his doorstep. During their conversation, he noticed something was not right with Father Paul. Then he saw an old photograph that clearly depicted a young Father John. Joe realized something was amiss and tried to leave, but it was too late. The priest grabbed him, and during the struggle, Joe fell and hit his head on the corner of a table. Bleeding profusely, he lay on the ground, quickly losing breath. The priest greedily lapped up the blood from the floor, and not satisfied, even began to suck the wound directly. The scene shifts to Aaron, who was 20-something weeks pregnant and visited Dr. Sarah's home for an ultrasound. She shared with the doctor her hopes for the child and her dreams for its future. However, the doctor told her there was nothing in her womb. Aaron was baffled by the revelation. The doctor explained that at her stage of pregnancy, even if she had miscarried, she should have noticed. Strangely, she had no awareness of it, and just yesterday, she had felt the baby kicking. But now, the doctor informed her that the baby that had been growing inside her for over five months had inexplicably vanished. It was all too bizarre. The doctor suggested Aaron get checked out at a hospital on the mainland, but Aaron couldn't believe this was happening because she had no signs of miscarriage and even no pain. How could her baby just disappear without a trace? After Aaron left, Sarah's old mother came in, looking astonishingly younger, as if she had shed 20 years. Sarah, however, was not as thrilled by her mother's dramatic change as one might expect. Instead, she was deeply worried. It was too unnatural. Just then, Aaron's blood sample under the sunlight began to boil and eventually shattered the test tube. Sarah looked at the broken glass, pensive. Meanwhile, the church was packed, but the priest was nowhere to be seen. Bev decided to check on the situation. When she opened the door, she found Joe lying breathless on the ground and Father Paul bloodied and disheveled. Bev was not panicked, but rather composed. She instructed the priest to clean up before heading to church. However, his actions directly contradicted her plan. She quickly devised a strategy, returning to the church to take charge, announcing that the priest, due to health reasons, could not attend today's mass, and from now on, services would be held in the evening. She then summoned the mayor and the bearded captain to the priest's house. They were utterly shocked by the scene before them. The mayor questioned the priest about what had happened. Hearing this, Bev slapped him, proclaiming that anyone who disobeys the priest who stands before Jehovah must die. Bev's persuasive words, along with the intimidation of the angel of God, meant that from then on, they became the most devoted of congregants. At this time, Aaron took a ferry and arrived at the mainland hospital. After a thorough examination, the results she received were identical to those given by Dr. Sarah. The doctors couldn't believe that Aaron had ever been pregnant. The tests showed all her indicators were negative. Even if she had a miscarriage, the values would remain elevated for up to six weeks. They saw no evidence that Aaron had ever been pregnant. In the end, the doctor even suggested that she should see someone from the mental health department. 
Riley showed up as promised for the AA meeting that evening, but Joe was nowhere to be seen. When he asked the priest why Joe hadn't come, the priest told him that Joe had left the island to visit his sister on the mainland. This set off alarm bells for Riley because he knew the priest was lying. During their last encounter, Joe had confided that his sister had passed away months ago. Riley went home with a head full of doubts. His mother spoke only of Father Paul, praising the priest whose arrival had brought numerous miracles to the island. Because of their faith, his parents' health had improved dramatically. The mother hoped Riley could let go of the past, emerge from the shadows, and become a person of faith. But Riley was consumed by worry and ignored her pleas. He told his mother that Father Paul had lied to him and urged her to be cautious. That was his only request. Then he embraced her tightly, as if saying goodbye. Riley had intended to spend the night with Aaron, who had suffered a miscarriage, but something didn't feel right. He stopped in his tracks. He needed to confront the priest about the lies. Meanwhile, the priest was muttering prayers, pleading with his guardian angel for protection and guidance. But in the next moment, he confessed to being lost without the Eucharist. He knelt devoutly, waiting for the angel's favor. The angel then cut its wrist, letting blood as a sacred offering to its most faithful follower. However, just then Riley walked in. He saw the angel, who turned and attacked him viciously. The priest slowly closed the church doors, and no one knew what happened inside. No one could ever have imagined that Father Paul, so trusted by the islanders, harbored such darkness. Aaron waited for Riley all night, her calls unanswered, and a bad feeling grew inside her. In a panic, she went to Riley's house, where his mother told her he wasn't home. She thought Riley had been with Aaron the previous night. Aaron then went to the docks, where his brother Warren also said Riley hadn't come home all night. With no other choice, Aaron sought the sheriff's help. Meanwhile, Dr. Sarah was at her computer researching why Aaron's blood sample boiled when exposed to sunlight. Suddenly, she heard her elderly mother's voice behind her. Turning around, Sarah exclaimed in surprise at the youthful appearance. This was no elderly mother, she looked just like Sarah's sister. But Sarah, staring at this familiar stranger, couldn't muster a smile. It wasn't that she was unhappy, but reason and science told her this made no sense. She knew well the adage that abnormal occurrences suggest something sinister. Her mother took her to church for mass, only to discover that the service had been moved to the evening. The congregation was astounded by the transformation of Sarah's mother from an old lady to a young woman, calling it a miracle. However, all of this was attributed to Father Paul's arrival, which deepened their admiration and conviction in the priest. At midnight, a group of faithful parishioners arrived as scheduled. The church was filled with devout worshipers, and the priest began to teach what he called doctrine. He started off speaking eloquently and with grace, as Sarah's mother sent fervent glances his way, suggesting that their relationship was more than ordinary. However, as the priest continued, his tone changed abruptly, and with it, his role, from a priest to the leader of a cult. He declared that God would soon require them to do terrible things, and as members of God's army, they should abandon the old covenant and obey without question. The followers nodded in agreement, their eyes ablaze. The priest welcomed them to God's army, proclaiming that they were destined for great deeds. But Sarah's mother's face turned pale. After the ceremony, she left the church in a flustered state and turned to Sarah, saying that she hoped Sarah would never come back here. This is not the church she knew, and the priest is no longer the man she recognized. Meanwhile, Aaron was listlessly lying on the couch when a knock at the door came. She hurried to open it, and there was Riley, the man she longed for, alive and well. An oblivious Aaron expressed her concerns for him and began to scold him for keeping her to wait. But Riley had no intention of explaining too much. He invited Aaron to join him for a boat ride on the sea to share their thoughts. Drifting on the sea's surface amidst the endless night, Riley recounted the events of that day. He had indeed died, but was resurrected by an angel who gave him its blood, just like Father Paul before him. He was reborn the next morning, but he realized he was no longer the Riley he used to be. Though he could now live forever, ageless and immortal, it came with a price. He began to fear sunlight, became bloodthirsty and lost his humanity, forced to drink blood to quench his hunger. Moreover, the priest admitted to killing Joe but felt no guilt, believing it to be God's will. The priest told him to be grateful for the angel who chose them and resurrected them. Since they have been blessed by the angel, they must share this gift, bringing its benefits to many more. Riley walked out of the church in a daze, as if everything had changed. Now, he could hear the heartbeat of people clearly and their conversations. Returning home, he looked at his sleeping parents. He didn't disturb them or get close, wanting to say goodbye but lacking the courage. Then, at his final stop, Riley came to Aaron's house. 
This was everything that had happened to him that day. Aaron couldn't believe that everything he said was true. And even if it was, why bring her to a boat with no escape? At that moment, Aaron's arteries were visibly pulsing in the eyes of Riley, who was hungry. He quickly assured her that he didn't bring her here to frighten her, nor to trap her. On the contrary, he came to trap himself. He wanted her to row this small boat to the mainland, leave this place, and never look back. Riley needed Aaron to believe his story was true, so he wanted his beloved to witness it all. As the sun began to rise in the east, Riley said his final goodbye to Aaron, confessing his love for her in some way all his life, and he had tried his best. He then closed his eyes, and the victim girl he had killed in the past car accident appeared before him, showing his constant inner demon. The girl reached out her hand, and in that moment, Riley chose to reconcile with his past and journeyed to a new beyond. To Aaron's shock, Riley burst into flames under the sunlight. Aaron sat opposite, wailing until Riley turned completely to ash. The sea breeze scattered the ashes into the ocean as the sun shone on Aaron's face. She gathered her composure, picked up the oars, and began to row the broken Tesla boat. Ignoring Riley's advice to flee to the mainland, she returned to the island, determined to stop the disaster unfolding around her. As she passed the church, she noticed the captain posting a notice. Only then did Aaron realize that today was the vigil of Easter Sunday. The priest seemed to have sensed Riley's death, as though he had the foresight of Lisa's ability to walk. Aaron knocked on Dr. Sarah's door and told her she needed help. After recounting Riley's terrifying incident to Sarah, surprisingly, Sarah did not disbelieve her. Instead, she conducted an experiment, placing a sample of her mother's blood in a container under the sunlight, which promptly ignited. It appeared Sarah had long harbored suspicions about the mysterious priest. At that moment, Sarah's mother walked in, rejuvenated, looking decades younger. Aaron was astounded by the sight of the elderly woman now looking so youthful. The only three lucid people on the island began to devise a plan. Sarah discovered that the drastic changes in the townspeople's behavior were due to alterations in their blood composition. Fortunately, her mother's and Aaron's blood remained normal. If a mutation occurred, there would be a fierce craving for the iron in the blood, similar to the priest's condition, a thirst for blood, and an aversion to light. Sarah deduced that this was the underlying cause of the mother's rejuvenation and Aaron's miscarriage. Upon learning all of this, Aaron remembered Riley's last words to her, urging her to flee from this island. So the trio decided to head to the mainland that afternoon to explain the situation and seek help from outside. Afterward, Aaron visited Riley's family to honor his last wish and persuade them to leave the island. However, Riley's mother's deep faith in God meant they were planning to attend the Mass that evening. Clearly, their fervent faith had clouded their judgment. Aaron reluctantly informed them of Riley's death, but his mother refused to believe it and pushed Aaron away, insisting she leave. Later, the three women arrived at the dock as planned, only to find both ferries gone. The captain informed them that both vessels were broken and had been sent for repair. This simultaneous breakdown was unprecedented and suspicious, hinting at a premeditated plan. As night fell, the captain shut down all the island's power signals. It seemed the midnight party was going to be a significant event. Despite this, the three women did not back down and decided to attend the mass to try and save the innocent parishioners. Meanwhile, Bev led the mayor's family, each holding a candle, singing Jehovah's hymns as they circumnavigated the island. What began as a group of four quickly swelled to a hundred. The scene in the dead of night was eerily inexplicable. The procession slowly entered the church, where the priest, dressed in gold investments, apologized to the congregation. Shockingly, he revealed he wasn't Father Paul, but the well-known Father John, reborn by divine grace. He proclaimed he would grant eternal life to all the faithful on the island that night. The captain, devoutly, knelt before the altar, awaiting God's blessing. He drank from the poisoned chalice the priest offered, setting an example for the congregation and thus completed his transformation. As he convulsed and eventually lay still, the crowd was terrified, yet with the priest present, they chose to believe and quietly awaited the miracle. The sheriff sensed something was amiss in the church and tried to leave with his son. At that moment, an angel in a golden robe appeared at the door to flex his bald head. The priest shouted that this was God, an angel, a miracle. As the group watched in horror, the angel stepped forward and unfolded its wings, and just then, the deceased captain revived, completing his transformation from human into vampire. The captain's example reassured the people, and they no longer feared. The sheriff attempted to leave with his son again, but the boy was completely enthralled. The sheriff fired a warning shot, but he was outnumbered and quickly subdued by a few parishioners. 
Under Bev's influence, they drank the poison, each proclaiming their choice for God. The church, meant to be a sanctuary, began to fill with a sinister presence as the priest continued to shout about faith. Sarah's mother could no longer stand by. She picked up the sheriff's gun and shot the priest in the forehead, hitting her target squarely. The priest fell to the ground with a thud. However, he was not dead for good. Seeing this, the bloodthirsty angel furiously pounced on Sarah's mother, probably wanting to have a vampire baby with her. She was pretty dead as shit. Just as Bev was about to issue some command to the captain, she sensed something was off. She knew very well that the captain had completed his transformation. That meant he would now have an insatiable craving for fresh blood. Bev started to panic. She feared that once they awoke, she would become their next drink. It seemed she hadn't completed her transformation. She was merely infatuated with the feeling of having control over everything. The sheriff's son then woke up, followed by Lisa's mother and father. One by one, all those who had taken the poisoned wine woke up and transformed. Lisa excitedly hugged her mother, but there was something off about her. Her mother told her that the world looked completely different to her now, and her father wasn't any better. He slowly approached a young girl who had not transformed. Lisa's mother gazed at her daughter's artery with a greedy expression. The father grabbed the girl and wanted to take her blood. The girl resisted fiercely, and the entire church descended into chaos in an instant. Those who hadn't transformed tried to flee, but the doors had been locked much earlier. They began to fall into despair. On the other side, Aaron and the others gathered and ran towards the back door. Riley's father, in a bid to allow his wife and children to escape, used his body to shield his family. Aaron and the others managed to escape to a small cabin that led to the back door. Ironically, Bev, the usually authoritative woman, was hiding there alone. Bev told Aaron that her gun was useless against her, that there was no death in her world, and that shooting her would only put her to rest for five minutes. Aaron didn't waste words with Bev. She raised her gun and fired, saying they now had five minutes to escape. So they fled quickly through the back door. When Bev awoke, she found the world had changed. She walked slowly to the lobby. The floor had been stained blood red, and the air was filled with the pungent smell of blood. Soon, everyone in the church had completed their transformation. Then, Bev ordered the doors to be opened. She believed it was time to start spreading the great gospel. In a blink of an eye, the church was empty. The priest had also awakened, sitting despondently on the steps. Outside the church, a woman suddenly came to her senses. It was Sarah's mother, who had been dragged away by the angel. She had been killed by the angel and now had awakened, which meant she, too, had been transformed. She entered the church and sat next to the priest she both loved and hated. At that moment, the island was like a vampire apocalypse, with large groups of the congregation spreading the vampire gospel everywhere. They bit anyone they saw, completely devoid of humanity. Only a few strong-willed and kind individuals were holding on to their last shred of decency, like Riley's father and the sheriff's son. The six individuals who had fled the church were now hiding in the Aaron family home. Together, they deliberated their next move. Unfortunately, the island had no electricity, no boats, and no signal. The once beautiful and prosperous island had turned into a chaotic place. They could have escaped to a nearby island on Warren's boat, but then they remembered those who had been transformed. The thought of them reaching the mainland was too horrifying to contemplate. So, they decided that Warren and Lisa would take the boat to the neighboring island, while the four adults would stay to prevent the disaster from spreading. Just then, a torch was thrown in from outside. It was Bev and the captain, hot on their trail. Riley's mother stepped forward, choosing to make the same sacrifice as her husband. She slit her own throat to buy the other's time, knowing full well their insatiable thirst for blood. Sure enough, Bev's eyes soon became glazed over with desire. Indeed, she could not resist the temptation of such a delicacy. With her noble act, Riley's mother successfully bought time for Aaron and the others to escape. The two devout Christians had become vampires. Bev and the captain greedily drank the blood from Riley's mother's body. Looking at the blazing fire before them, the captain remarked that the sea breeze was strong and if not extinguished promptly, it could set the entire island ablaze, much like the fire incident in the past. This comment reminded Bev of something important. Although the island's houses had been burned down that year, the church, far from the residential area, remained unscathed. Seizing upon this idea, Bev suggested to the captain to let the fire burn even more fiercely so the church would become their only sanctuary. The subtext was clear. The malicious Bev intended to rule as queen. After the two left, Riley's mother slowly opened her eyes. 
Inside the church, the priest and Sarah's mother were sitting together hand in hand. He confessed that everything he had done was to make his beloved woman young again. He couldn't bear to watch the love of his life grow old and die because their family had never truly been together. From his words, a bombshell was dropped. Sarah was in fact the priest's biological daughter. Due to various reasons, they had never recognized each other, and the priest could only watch her from afar within the church. The situation had spiraled far beyond his original intentions, but fate would not grant him a second chance to start over. When Aaron and her companions reached the square, they encountered Lisa's father. As everyone knew, Lisa's father had undergone a transformation and was no longer the man he once was. The sheriff approached and fired a shot at him, but when he tried to shoot again, he was out of bullets. And even if he had bullets, it wouldn't have made much difference. Danger was everywhere. Aaron had no choice but to tell Warren to take Lisa and flee to a nearby island for safety. Lisa led Warren to Joe's place. They grabbed a shotgun and a can of gasoline. In this moment of crisis, Lisa was much calmer and braver than Warren. Now, with fires raging across the island and few houses left unburned, the haunting cries of Lisa's parents could be heard everywhere. The two quickly found a house that was not on fire and took shelter inside. But as luck would have it, as soon as they entered, they found the body of a dead crew member and an angel sipping on the blood. Warren was terrified, but Lisa resolutely raised the shotgun and pulled the trigger. However, it was like scratching an itch for the angel. This infuriated Lisa, who then doused the angel with gasoline and continued pouring it all the way to the door. With a stylish flick of her lighter, she set the angel ablaze and the creature screamed in agony before shooting up into the sky. Aaron and two others arrived at the dock where they poured gasoline over all the boats. In an instant, the shoreline was ablaze with light. In that way, they made sure that no one could leave the island. Meanwhile, Riley's parents had finally reunited, both transformed. They didn't harm any islanders despite the unbearable blood hunger they felt. They were determined not to let their thirst turn them into inhuman beasts. Elsewhere, Bev had filled the entire community center with cots. She looked at everything before her and wondered if this was really the outcome she desired. She walked to the church and rang the savan bell, signaling everyone to gather there. When the priest arrived, Bev told him of her plan to spread the vampire gospel to more people on the mainland. The priest vehemently disagreed, saying that this was not his original intent and everything was wrong. He was no longer the same priest. They were no longer God's holy children, but a pack of bloodthirsty demons. This completely ruptured their relationship, and with the priest out of the picture, Bev was now the sole ruler of the island. She then looked at the two of them and said with malice that she truly hoped they both enjoyed this sunrise of death. By this time, all the transformed had gathered at the church entrance. Whether someone could enter the Ark to shelter from the sunlight was entirely up to Bev. She quickly found a target, a man she despised and ruthlessly denied him entry. The man knelt on the ground, weeping bitterly. Unable to watch this, the priest told the crowd that the church would welcome them and shield anyone from the sunlight. No sooner had he spoken than he saw Sarah spreading gasoline inside the church. The priest was not angry but proud because Sarah was his biological daughter. He told Sarah the truth. After a brief moment of shock, Sarah accepted her biological father. But then, a gunshot rang out suddenly. The captain had shot and killed Sarah. The priest pushed the captain to the ground and strangled him in anger. The priest, having calmed down, tried to revive Sarah with his blood, but the stubborn Sarah spat it all out. She did not want to live that way. The priest never imagined that the day he recognized his daughter would be their last. He carried his daughter out, and before leaving, Sarah's mother knocked over the candles in the church. The two parents took their daughter to her favorite little bridge, quietly waiting for the sunrise. At this point, the only refuge left on the island was now at risk. The sheriff had surrounded the community center with gasoline. Bev spotted him and shot him, thinking she had thwarted his plan. However, unbeknownst to her, Aaron had already doused the inside of the building with gasoline. Just as Aaron was about to ignite it, a bloodthirsty angel descended from the sky and tackled her sexy body to the ground, possibly wanting to have a vampire baby with her. Bev laughed triumphantly, but her celebration was premature. At that moment, the sheriff's son picked up a lighter and threw it, opting to side with his father. With that, the last sanctuary on the island was lost. Bev was utterly bewildered. The sheriff then quoted a verse from the Bible to Bev. The sun shines on the good and the evil alike. Turning to Aaron, she took out a knife and using all her strength shredded the wings of the angel. 
By the time the creature realized, the sun was nearly rising. Humiliated, it frantically tried to fly away to save its shitty life, leaving Aaron lying on the ground, reminiscing about the time spent with Riley. Meanwhile, Lisa and Warren had already successfully floated out to sea when they suddenly saw a big bat-like creature clumsily fleeing to the west with its broken wings. Warren told Lisa that the nearest shelter land against the sunlight was at least 48 kilometers away. With its speed, it was impossible for the creature to reach safety before sunrise. Riley's parents led the remaining people in singing hymns. Soon the sun rose over the horizon. The transformed people died still holding on to their faith. Having faith is certainly not wrong. It's the endless desires of humanity that are the mistake. The priest finally got his wish, to be with the two women he loved forever. The sheriff's son brought his father to the seaside with Bev nearby, frantically digging in the sand to protect herself from the sunlight, but to no avail. She ultimately reaped what she had sown and was burned to ashes. The scene shifts to the sea, where, on this small island of only 127 people, only two young individuals survived. The sunlight shone on the faces of the children, and particles of dust settled like falling snow. Lisa mentioned she could no longer feel her legs without the creature's magic. Yet there was no sense of loss or sorrow between them. Instead, there was a feeling of acceptance. In life, sometimes getting what you want may not be good, and losing may not necessarily be bad. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.